Oh, well, Professor Bradley, it's so nice to, uh, to visit with you uh, and have a chance to talk about your scholarship and your leadership in the university. Uh, can we start by talking about what you're working on now? Your, your first book um, was a big success, and I wondered it, what you're following that up with now. Well, uh, my first book, Harlem versus Columbia University, Black Student Power in the Late 1960s, was, uh, was in a way an, an entree for my, for my new research, which is dealing with black student activism in the Ivy League during the, the 1945 to 1975 kind of period. And so uh, taking into account all of the various social movements that were occurring, uh, but focusing specifically on the civil rights and, and, and black power movements and the influences that those movements would have on uh, college students. Uh, and so, you know, it, in that way it manifests itself in various things. So you see these black culture centers, you see black studies programs, mm -hmm. you see uh, an increase in black student population and, and black faculty population. And so to me it's, just, it's fascinating that such a small group of people, meaning black students, mm -hmm. were able to influence and alter in a lot of ways uh, these uh, most American uh, institutions, that is these institutions that have been around before there was an official yeah. nation, that they could change things sometimes shut these institutions down and uh, do those kinds of things so that there are opportunities for other African-American students that follow them. So. so usually when we think about student protest in the civil rights movement, we think about southern universities like North Carolina A&T. So how, what were the main differences between southern um, movements and movements in New England uh, Ivy League universities? Yeah, absolutely. So, so, so some of the things that we think about are, are is the fact that these are uh, elite private institutions. Mm -hmm. And I think that that, that that means something because they answer to different people. So institutions like North Carolina A&T or Southern University in New Orleans uh, or you know uh, a lot of these various institutions, Fisk in Nashville, yeah. Uh, they have to answer to the state, they have to answer to, to local populations and things like this. These Ivy League institutions, however, they answer to the trustees uh, of the institution and, and a very strong alumni uh, group. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the things that, that they're able to do by way of the resources they have available to them, uh, by way of the tradition that, that they seem to be steeped in, uh, these are things that challenge that challenge students in ways that, that might be a little bit different in, in some of these uh, in some of these public schools that are that are in the South. And so, uh, to me, that was fascinating the the fact that that at these Ivy League institutions, these these institutions that are kind of the jewels of mm -hmm. of U.S. society. That is, you know, you don't have to go to college to know that you want to go to Harvard. You don't have <laughs> to go to college to know that you want to go to Yale or Princeton and that sort of thing. That that. These students, and, and most of them, you know, most African Americans uh, arrived at these institutions after World War II and, and during the 1960s as this, this, this civil rights movement was unfurling, uh, that these students would, would consider more than themselves, I think it's totally apropos yeah. for, for, for these times, but consider more than themselves uh, to try to affect policies uh, towards neighboring communities uh, and also make it possible for, for, for more students to attend and get jobs for people like me, professors. <laughs> so. Well, the other thing you've done over the last year or so is take over leadership of the African American Studies program. So tell me a little bit about the challenges and the opportunities and the things you've been able to accomplish at African American Studies. Yeah, that's a real blessing. I think uh, 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 we were uh, set on, on a strong foundation and so one of the, the the best parts about the job is just the opportunity to, to, to provide more resources and to help students in a larger way than I would have been able to had I you know, remained a, a faculty member. Mm -hmm. uh, so in this administrative post, I get the opportunity to, to help students in, in ways that I never thought I could help before, so that's good. Also, I get a chance to, to uh, see just how good the faculty are at this institution and particularly in African American studies. And so we have uh, faculty members who are joint appointed, some mm -hmm. who are uh, solely in African American studies. And so uh, I learn quite a bit about their research. I learn about their, their teaching and just how much students love them and, and how well they do in their, their particular fields. One of the most difficult things uh, about it all is, is uh, 
knowing that work is never done. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, so I'm, I'm task oriented. And so the idea that, that I finish this and, and so whew, we can take a rest. But there is no finish. There yeah. is no finish. So that's the hardest part about administration for me so far. The other thing is, is we don't train for this in graduate school yeah. to, to, to be any kind of administrator. And so uh, learning to deal with budgets, learning to deal with all kinds of forms and things like this. Uh, some days I say, if I could just read a book, uh, <laughs> you know. But it's, it's, been, it's been overall a very positive experience. And, and I'm so happy that uh, African American Studies uh, is, is on a trajectory really to influence uh, the city and, and, and I think the, the region, but we're uh, most certainly g gaining a national acclaim for ourselves. Excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you.